Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sunday's edition of Weekend Waypoints here at SEC Extra D1Baseball.com, presented today by Active Wealth Management. That's our Sunday sponsor for every edition of Weekend Waypoints. Ford Stokes and Sam Davis over at Active Wealth Management. Uh, big college baseball guys, good guys that uh, you know I've, I've gotten to know a little bit the last few weeks. And a um, few offers out there for you. Um, you'll see the one scrolling there at the bottom. Uh, for a free 401k review, a $1,500 value at no cost to you if you visit activewealth.com and schedule a consultation. Uh, you'll also, with Ford and Sam, you'll also learn that your portfolio can become more fee efficient and you can avoid costly hidden fees with a proper investment mix. Uh, you know, I'm a layman, but that sounds sounds pretty good to me. Um, you'll also learn about educational and fun events that are that clients can attend several times a year. They're in the uh, a little bit in the events business as, you know, as a, as a lot of companies, D1 Baseball included, last year, you know, we did a, a live show for the for the SEC tournament. So uh, understand the value of those. Ford and Sam do as well. And they put on events for their clients. So again, activewealth.com, schedule a consultation, get that $1,500 value a for, in, in the form of a 401k review, totally free of charge. Again, activewealth.com. All right, folks, let's uh, let's talk some ball. A busy Saturday around the SEC, nine games when you consider the um, the two doubleheaders, one where I was at in Columbia, South Carolina, Vanderbilt, South Carolina, and we'll, we'll talk about that. I mean, just did not see that result coming yesterday. Um, and then, of course, Georgia and Alabama, and, and actually, frankly, didn't see that result coming either. So two surprising uh, doubleheader results yesterday. So lots, a lot to get into in addition to just the, the rest of the the schedule. I'll pull up the the scoreboard from yesterday here. So yeah, so there we go. Um, so you see the nine games there. Um, some really interesting stuff ended late with an eleven inning win for Florida over LSU. We'll we'll get into that specifically. But doubleheader sweep for South Carolina, doubleheader sweep for Georgia. That's that's huge for Georgia to not have that hole get dug any bigger after a tough opening weekend of of SEC play against Kentucky. Speaking of Kentucky, they fell victim to Missouri. First SEC win of the season for Carrick Jackson and the Missouri Tigers. First career SEC win for Carrick Jackson as a head coach. Um, so good, on, good on Missouri to, to get off the, you know, get off the the zero in the in the win column in SEC play and and, and get that done. So kudos to them. A big win for Ole Miss coming back against Tennessee. That's going to be a really interesting uh, rubber match today in Knoxville. A and M took care of business to close out that series against Mississippi State. Auburn did a nice job salvaging a win there against Arkansas yesterday. And again, you know, much like I talked about with Georgia getting out of the hole, Auburn was staring 0-6 in the face, but made a late comeback there to, to win that game against Arkansas. Really impressive stuff. And, and kind of what I expected from Auburn. Just we know how tough that team is. We know how talented that team is. So I'm not surprised that they won that game, although that did kind of happen in surprising fashion. Uh, let's talk about some specifics from the day. Uh, game of the day is that is that Florida LSU game. Florida six, LSU four in eleven innings. The big hit was a two run home run from Jack Caglione. Stop if I me mean, if you've heard this before. Jack Caglione is is pretty good, but just a absolute missile of a home run to right center that looked like it was one of those home runs where you weren't sure if it was going to be high enough to get out. Right? I mean, it was just a line drive that just had enough carry on it to get to get out. And and frankly, if it had if it had hit the wall, uh, if, if that if that ball had hit the wall at Alec Box Stadium, it, it might have knocked a hole in the wall just because I mean that ball was was hit so hard. Uh, Armstrong coming in here with you know LSU played a good game against great competition and fell short. A few untimely walks really hurt, but played error free with eleven hits. It was important for the pitching to look better this weekend. Totally agree. Um, I, I thought Gage Jump was was good enough. I mean that that effort's going to be good enough a lot of times in the SEC, especially for a Saturday guy. With an offense, at least the top half of the lineup as physical as, as Florida's, you, you'll you'll take that. I, so I totally agree. Like I, you lost a tough game against Florida, you know. I, I, so I'm not not too not too worried about that from an LSU perspective. Although the the um, the rubber game there is is pretty feels pretty important for LSU. Um, we'll be interested to see that how they do against Jack Caglione on the mound, and how Thatcher Hurd comes out and, and throws the ball this weekend against the Gators. So definitely looking forward forward to that. Um, Florida in the win um, it does what they've kind of had to do. And, and at least as long as things stay the same, what they're going to have to do, which is overcome 
another tough Liam Peterson start. They're they're sticking to their rotation for now, and I, and I get that. We've we've talked about um, we, we we've talked about they they just don't have a lot of options, right? Whether it's you can't really move Cags off Sunday, or at least you don't want to. Um, and the fact that their bullpen is a lot of freshmen <laughs> and, and guys, you don't want to move out of their bullpen roles because there's value in that too. So, you know, they're, they got to kind of wear it for now and hope that things eventually get better by the time, you know, May, June rolls around. But for now that they're, they're having to work around some less than stellar efforts from some guys. And, and they were able to, they were able to do it on, on Saturday. Armstrong on YouTube also says it's time for Ty Evans to start receiving one, one talk. Good Lord, man. Yeah. The guy's good. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, one, one, a little, a little rich, obviously, but, but yeah, but he's, he's extremely talented. He was a guy that there was a lot of buzz about and it just, it just took him a while, you know, last season, he went through most of the season, just kind of, eh, you know, as, as far as production goes and he got to Omaha and went nuts. And, and so, you know, had, had Florida won, the national title last year, I think there's a decent chance Ty Evans ends up. Maybe it still would have been Cags because of just the, the fame of, of of that name, but he would have been in the discussion for most outstanding player. I mean, that's how good he was. So yeah, really, really talented guy. Gives him a lot, not only offensively, but plays a good right field. Made a nice catch in, in, to uh, you know help close out the game in the, in the bottom of the eleventh last night. Kind of dealing with the the bullpen over there and, and what have you. So certainly a very very talented guy, no doubt about that. Uh, let's talk player of the day. Uh, some options here. Uh, Charlie Condon, of course, like a broken record. Charlie Condon, a potential player of the day, like shocking. Uh, five for seven with three home runs and five RBI. There's also a video going around out there. I saw it retweeted by, I believe Stephen Shock retweeted it. So, but um, don't hold me to that, but you'll find it. He hit a home run over the batter's eye yesterday, in which the announcers just didn't say anything and just started laughing instead of calling the home run because it's just, you know, what else can you talk about guys who have improved their draft stock and are now in the one, one conversation. I mean, going into the season, Charlie Condon was a very, very good prospect, but you, you kind of wondered, can he really leapfrog some of these guys that are, that are, that are at the top, you know, Travis Bazana from Oregon state, obviously CAGS. Um, if he keeps swinging the bat like this, the answer is definitively yes. <laughs> I mean, there, there is, increasing buzz that that he could actually be the first overall pick in the draft also i saw anthony dasher the beat writer who's who's been on my uh podcast weekend way po- or highway to hoover um that he's like 11 i think 11 home runs shy of the georgia all-time record which seems doable for him 11 home runs over the final you know eight weeks plus whatever postseason georgia has he'll be the georgia all-time home run hitter and he did that and he will have done that in two seasons if he gets there just in, incredible stuff and you can nitpick and say well the ball is clearly like the ball is jumping in college baseball we can we can all agree on that but consider that the guy he's chasing is Gordon Beckham who played when the bats were a lot hotter than they are now right so um just incredible and, and of course Gordon Beckham again did it he did it in three years which is impressive too but uh Charlie Condon potentially doing it in two years is is just kind of uh absurd uh, Rick Cruson on X, freshman right-hander Tyler Pitzer gets the start today for South Carolina versus Vanderbilt thoughts. Um, yeah, and, and then you ask about the big picture. I think I think there's some – so that's – I hadn't seen that yet this morning, so thank you, Rick. Um, I, I'll be there for that start, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. I do think it is part of South Carolina kind of trying to get some things in order, trying to figure some things out. I, they've definitely got something in Eli Jones. I wrote that yesterday. So, um, um, so there's that, um, you know, SQ is, has been fine, but then they've gone TBA the last couple weeks on Sunday. And so it did feel a little bit like the South Carolina was kind of reaching around for some answers. So I, I do think they are looking for some answers. And I thought, you know, Matthew Becker is a potential answer. You know, Ty Good could be a potential answer. Don't forget that guy was a heck of a starter at college at Charleston. Um, and then obviously Pitzer, Eddie Copper, maybe, you know, an answer. So they've they've got options. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh to seeing Pitzer in that in that role today. Uh quickly cleaning up these comments, then I'll get back to player of the day. Uh Armstrong, I think the rest of the SEC had an Ivan Drago moment. You see Arkansas bleeds, they're not a machine, they're men. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's fair. You know, um, and, and you know, you get it. You can maybe get him on Sunday with Molina, who's very good, but 
is not Hagen Smith, right? So, yeah, I agree there. Um, on X, LB Cowan says Corey Collins is the best leadoff hitter in the country. Yeah, good good day for Corey Collins. I think I had him on – yeah, Corey Collins, I had him on my list of potential players of the day, so that's a good segue back to it. Corey Collins, five for nine with a, with a home run in the doubleheader yesterday. Getting him going for Georgia would be – would be huge He's a veteran guy who you know has, has played a lot of baseball at georgia had a lot of success um big day for him uh gage miller for alabama on the losing end of that double header four for eight with two home runs a triple and five runs batted in uh, Braden montgomery for a m as they secured the series win over mississippi state two for three with two home runs three runs batted in cooper mcmurray in that win for auburn over arkansas two for three with a home run and four runs batted in and uh, uh, Andrew Fisher of Ole Miss, uh, two for three with two walks and two home runs. He's having a heck of a season for Ole Miss. That was in the win against Tennessee. But my player of the day is from a game where I was at, games, plural, where I was at, and that's Ethan Petrie. He reached base all eight times he came to the plate yesterday. Now, granted, one of those was an error, so sure, but I will say in his defense – the error was on a ball he hit hard up against the wall in deep center field. You know, Calvin Hewitt made an error on it, but he was running basically at the warning track to make the play. So it was a really well hit ball, um, but reaches all eight times, added two home runs, both of them in the second game of the doubleheader. He also walked four times. Um, I, I tweeted it yesterday, but th there was some perception, and I, I think I agreed that Petri was off to a slow start. He didn't quite look himself, but kind of seems like those days might be over. So my apologies to the rest of the SEC uh, because it looks like Ethan Petrie has has gotten hot again, and, and that was obviously a big part of South Carolina uh, doing what they did yesterday. Uh, okay, pitcher of the day. Um, Brian Zeldin in relief uh, for Georgia uh, in game one. I wanted to shout him out just because a really good relief effort. And I, I try to – anytime I see a relief effort like this, I, I try to fold it in. But uh, four shutout innings for Georgia in, in game one of that doubleheader. Uh, Eli Jones, I mentioned him for South Carolina. Believe it or not, he's actually not my pitcher of the day. He's probably the runner-up, but six and a third innings, one hit, two runs. Did so on 77 pitches. That was really, really impressive. Um, his counterpart in the game, Carter Holton, six innings pitch, three hits, two runs, four walks, 10 strikeouts. Uh, Javen Pimentel, shout out. Uh, you know, if he doesn't pitch as well as he does, Mizzou doesn't win the game. And, and he's actually been really – he pitched well against Arkansas. So it's been a couple weeks now that Javen Pimentel has been really good for Missouri. Six innings pitched, four hits, one run, one walk, five strikeouts. Uh, his counterpart in that game, Dom Nyman for, for Kentucky, a couple of good starts for him to start this season, uh, SEC season. Seven innings pitched, five hits, two runs, no walks, nine strikeouts. And then Liam Doyle, some of the numbers here aren't necessarily great, but when you consider the opponent in Tennessee, his line, which is six innings pitched, three hits, four runs, three of them earned, with a walk and 10 strikeouts, um, looks pretty good against the quality of offense that Tennessee is, and also just what Ole Miss needs, right? I mean, sure, that's not the cleanest start. It's it's pretty decent, but you'll take that against a team like like Tennessee, and especially given where Ole Miss came from, where last year even getting that kind of start was was a real real struggle. So that's impressive. But my pitcher of the day, Justin Lampkin, Texas A and M, against Mississippi State to secure that series win. Seven and a third innings pitched, two hits, one run one walk and 12 strikeouts out dueling Gerangelo Sanja, who a and uh, handled fairly well. Uh, so, so did what they needed to do there. Uh, Kendall Rogers was at that game yesterday and he wrote a little bit on both a and and Mississippi state. So go check that out on the site. If you have not read it already. Um, I think his takeaway, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but, but based on what he told me, uh, he came away impressed obviously with A&M, but also Mississippi State, even in a losing effort. I mean, that, that team is is clearly improved, and, and he came away with that that same takeaway that, that Mark and I have had, and we've talked about them on, on Highway to Hoover and, and other places so far this season. So, um, But Justin Lampkin, pitcher of the day. Uh, Clay Phillips on X, a, a, a uh, someone I interact, a Vanderbilt fan I, I interact with quite a bit on Twitter, but Vandy boys gave away those games, and then, and then he says hashtag errors. Yeah, especially in game one. Um, you know, game two wasn't the cleanest game either, but it, it did feel like South Carolina did more offensively in the second game. But the first game, yeah, they had one – Vanderbilt had one really bad defensive inning where they made three errors. Could have been four. There was one – a play with Davis Diaz at third base that I would have scored an error. It got scored a hit. It was a misplay regardless, no matter how you look at it. 
but yeah, just not a good defensive day, especially that 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 fateful inning for Vanderbilt. It did lead to them dropping that that first game. So that that is something that you know. I mean, some of it is is not like the Calvin Hewitt drop in center field. Like I'm not worried about Calvin Hewitt as a defensive center fielder, but you know, RJ Austin has looked a little unnatural at first base. And and I know Tim Corbin kind of subscribes to the, the theory of which I understand the, the logic anyway, uh, of we want an athlete at first base because they touch the ball on basically every play. You want someone who is comfortable handling the ball. I get that. Um, but he, he doesn't look all that natural over there. Like it, there's some times where he, you know, kind of gets caught in between covering the bag and uh, or he'll, he'll, he'll wait on another hop instead of attacking a ball when he should attack the ball. Just little things like that, that first basemen who have been first basemen for a long time tend to kind of have an innate feel for that. He, he doesn't yet. Now he's a great athlete. Um, he, he's, his glove is typically good. So uh, there's potential there, but it just right now just looks a little bit wonky over there. We'll see. Uh, what the alternatives are, where they where they kind of go from there. Chris Maldonado, obviously not an option there. He was the guy who handled a lot of – he handled some first base earlier this season and, and some last season. So it kind of feels like a situation where given the alignment that's working right now for Vanderbilt, um, that R.J. Austin is just going to have to get better there. Um, yeah, and Clay mentions it. I, I should have mentioned this. So, yeah, on X, uh, R.J. took a ball to the face Tuesday, looked a little gun shy yesterday. Yeah. I, that might be fair. Um, that might that might explain some of like the the taking an extra hop, right? Instead of coming in on a ball, uh, that's totally fair. It's something I should have mentioned. Like that that could be a factor. Like yeah, he didn't you know didn't miss time with that. I don't believe no didn't miss time. So you know tough kid you know d- dealt with it. But but yeah. So uh, heck, if if you put me over there after getting hit in the face with a ball, like I'm sure I would react similarly, much less this high level division one college baseball player. Um, you know, if he's doing that, certainly I, I would be as well. So I get it, but, um, let's see who, let's wrap up some of these comments real quick. And then I will talk about today's game of the day. Um, Carl Dunn says great on YouTube says great game last night. Sorry that LSU lost today sits up for a great game and a rematch of game three from the CWS. Absolutely. Looking forward to that one. It's actually, not my game of the day, but that's kind of nitpicky just because I feel like we've, we've seen, talked a lot about LSU Florida. We've, so those game, those teams have been like in the, in the spotlight quite a bit, but certainly could be the game of the day. Um, but yeah, just, um, yeah, he- going to be a heck of a game. I- I'm fascinated to see it. Uh, C Sperryman or CS Perryman perhaps on YouTube. You need to shoot a spitball at whoever is in charge of league scheduling. How in the world do you put a national title rematch on the first weekend of the incident of late tournament? Uh, a fair critique. I had not really thought about it that way. Um, but yes, if you are, if you are looking to maximize the number of eyeballs on a high profile SEC weekend, the way to do it is certainly not to put it on the first weekend of the NCAA basketball tournament. Great call there. I, I had uh, truly not thought of that, but, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, good stuff there. All right, let's let's wrap up real quick. Uh, talk about Sunday's game of the day. Again, it could be Florida LSU. That that certainly is is exciting. But I'm kind of fascinated by Ole Miss and Tennessee. Um, Tennessee was a TBA on the mound, and if they've announced a starter, I have I have not seen it. If if you guys have seen it, you can put it in the in the chat there wherever you're watching YouTube X, what have you, Facebook. Um, but originally it was a TBA. I kind of assumed going into the weekend it'd be AJ Russell like it was last week, but they used Russell in relief yesterday. So that is off the table. Uh, so we'll kind of have to see. I, I suspect it'll be a staff day. Even if Russell had started, it would have been a staff day, just given that they're being a little bit cautious with him right now. So there's that. Ole Miss is going with Grayson Sonye, who has been a little up and down, but has shown signs of being better than he was last year, which is kind of all they were asking uh, asking for them. But if, if, if Ole Miss is able to win this game, um, it really is kind of a narrative shifting series win for them. I mean, we, we have to start talking about them differently, much in the same way that I've said that, you know, if state can win a series against LSU and can come as close as they did to winning a series against Texas A&M, they can beat just about anybody with Ole Miss. You feel the same way. I mean, they win a series against South Carolina last weekend. Now, suddenly I, I came on here yesterday and was like, we'll find out how good South Carolina is. Well, we kind of saw what their ceiling was on Saturday, right? So, I, you know, you have to kind of give Ole Miss more credit for what they did last weekend against South Carolina. If they're able to back that up with a series win over Tennessee, 
all the more impressive and, and would definitely kind of, I, I assume if that happens, Mark and I on our next episode of Highway to Hoover, will have spent a lot of time just kind of talking about that and how it changes our perceptions of, uh, of the team. Uh, Cause certainly it would be to, to be able to pitch enough to get that done, especially at Lindsey Nelson uh, would be really, really impressive stuff. And even if they don't win today, I think I've come away again, much like with state come away impressed enough to say, Hey, these, these guys are, are going to be in it in SEC play. We still need to TBD on what the ceilings are, but but these guys are going to be in it. It's it's going to be very different than it was the last the last two years. So uh, that is certainly a step forward. So that is my game of the day there. Um, some plugs real quick. I mentioned Kindle uh, wrote something on A and M and Mississippi State. So go check that out. As always, the D one Digest is there if you want to catch up on what's happening around the rest of the country. You can certainly do that with the D one Digest. It's a great morning read to get you caught up on what's going on in college baseball. And then I wrote a story I mentioned earlier on Eli Jones for South Carolina and how uh, he perhaps has ended um, ha- has ended South Carolina's search for a Friday guy. You know, came into the year not really sure they had a Friday guy. Uh, but Eli Jones certainly looked the part yesterday re- by retiring the first 18 batters he faced uh, and then finished with six and a third innings pitch, used 77 pitches to just t- to get that far. He's an unconventional Friday guy. He's not pumping 97 up in the zone. Like he's he's a sinker guy, which is becoming more and more rare in today's game. But but he's really effective when he's on, and he, he was on yesterday. So you can check that out on the site right now as well. Uh, Jeremy Scott coming in just under the uh, under the wire here with his uh, on Facebook roll tide. Two tough losses yesterday. Hope they avoid the sweep today. Yes, obviously avoiding sweeps in SEC play is is kind of the name of the game. You want to take care of business at home and not get swept on the road, and that's. That's kind of um, that's kind of the old adage in the SEC, and it holds true for Alabama today. All right, folks, uh, that's going to do it for this edition of Weekend Waypoints. I appreciate you joining me again on uh, on a Sunday. Again, we're brought to you on Sundays by Active Wealth Management. Visit activewealth.com for that uh, 401k review, a $1,500 value at no cost to you. Talk to Ford Stokes or Sam Davis over there about uh, your portfolio, and uh, they can they can get you set up. Um, and walk you through everything. Again, activewealth.com. All right, folks, enjoy the baseball. It is The sun is out in Columbia, South Carolina for the first time since I've been here, so that is exciting. Looking forward to actually seeing the sun and seeing some baseball under the sun today. I hope the baseball is good where you are, and I will talk to you next Thursday, by the way, uh, Easter weekend coming up. So a lot of Thursday to Saturday series. So adjusted schedule next weekend. You guys are going to get four weekend waypoints next weekend as opposed to three. Don't say I never gave you nothing. Uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday this coming weekend. So I will talk to you Thursday morning with the next edition of Weekend Waypoints. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the baseball.